You can turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. This is where we will be this morning. Welcome to all of our viewers online as well. Yeah, glad, uh, glad everybody is either here or tuning in. So, Daniel 7. This is where this is the, we're entering the the back half of Daniel, and while the front half was a lot of narrative stories, historical accounts of what happened with Daniel and his friends, the second half of Daniel is the emphasis is on prophecy, and Daniel seven is one of those chapters where. I'm in the unenviable position of working through over 600 years of human history because that's what's contained in this single vision. Let's read Daniel 7 and then we'll we'll dig in. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down in the dream Uh, Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. Behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear, was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth, speaking great things. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like wool, pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment. The books were open. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away and their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions and behold... With the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. That all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth, uh, asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Then I desire to know the truth about the fourth beast which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about the ten horns that were on its head, the other horn that came up, and before which three of them fell. 
The horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things and that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came. And judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and shall be put down, and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law. They shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment. And his dominion shall be taken away and be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom. And all dominions shall serve and obey him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Indeed, Lord, may we take this matter to heart and learn the lessons of history, especially as it pertains to you, your greatness, and your kingdom, we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. How do we view governments? Maybe in seasons like we're in right now, we don't have too favorable of an opinion of governments. On a larger scale, maybe if we back off and think about our government specifically, historically, our democratic republic has existed and, and we have had and we continue to enjoy certain freedoms and certain privileges And so we may think of our government in a favorable way. And that's all right. Thank you very much. Hardworking folks in the back booth, awesome. That's right. And so we may think of governments in a favorable way, perhaps. On the other hand, backing off even further, historically, Not very many people have enjoyed the freedoms that we enjoy. In fact, for most of human history, the story about humanity has been one of oppression and enslavement. And and so maybe on a larger scale, we don't have too favorable of an opinion of human governments. Kind of like what we talked about last week. They're flawed. They come up short, and that's because they're run by and put in place by flawed human individuals in a fallen world. How does God view governments? And that that is really what Daniel 7 is about. It is God's view of human history, God's view of kingdoms, God's view of governments. And what we find is His view of governments very different than our view of governments. How does God view human kingdom, human history? Again, in Daniel 7, God invites us to see history and governments from His perspective. And it begins the first part of the vision with this vision of four beasts, uh, which uh, will come up here. There it is, yeah. Here they are, coming up out of the sea, these four Zoological monstrosities, right? Uh, There are some novel views of what these beasts are that are out there. Historically, guys have come up with different ideas of, of what is going on, what these beasts are, what they represent. But there is a traditional view, which I'm going to unpack. If you are interested in some of those other views, They're out there, you can find them, but the bottom line is, traditionally, how these four beasts have been understood by most commentators, most scholars, is you have 
Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. These four kingdoms that are yet to come. And they are pictured here in this vision. Prophetically. Metaphorically. And in the first place, uh, well, actually, what we can do is, what's fascinating is the parallel between Daniel 7 and Daniel 2 with Nebuchadnezzar's image. You remember, next up, there it is, that massive image that Nebuchadnezzar had uh, in his dream. And we walked through what each of those parts of that statue represent. The head of gold is you. And uh, if you need a refresher on that, the video is available on the Davis Park Church of Christ YouTube channel. You can go back and watch the Daniel 2 presentation for that. But if you need a refresher, we can actually do it right now because in the first place, that winged lion, that winged lion is Babylon. That's the first kingdom here, is pictured prophetically as a lion with eagle's wings, but those wings are plucked off. That may be imagery of what happened with Nebuchadnezzar when he lost his power. But then he's this, this winged lion, now no longer winged. This lion is made to stand on its two feet and given the mind of a man. Again, probably prophetically about Nebuchadnezzar coming back to power after uh, those seven times had passed upon him. And so there's a parallel here between the head of gold and this lion. It is also, by the way, Jeremiah pictures Babylon as a lion and an eagle over in Jeremiah 49, verses 17 through 22. And then after this lion, next comes this hunchback bear, and that is Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia, the Medo-Persian Empire, which would come after Babylon. Now, you've got to remember... Where we are, verse 1 tells us that Belshazzar, it's the first year of his reign. And we've talked about Belshazzar and we talked about chapter 5 and how his daddy, Nabonidus, was the king, but Belshazzar was co-regent with him. And while Nabonidus was out doing his Make Babylonian Idolatry Great Again campaign all over the empire, it was Belshazzar who was stuck in Babylon, although it wasn't too bad because People looked at him as the king. He was co-regent with his dad. We are 14 years away from when the Medo-Persian Empire will walk through the dried up aqueducts of Babylon and take over Babylon in a single night. Daniel 5, the end of Daniel 5 is where we see that. So approximately 14 years away from that event. And, and here is Daniel in the vision receiving about this hunchback bear one side raised up more than the other. And that seems to be a picture of the two sides of the Medo-Persian Empire. The Persians were actually a stronger part of that alliance than were the Medes. And so that hunchback bear that we see here. We're told that there are three ribs in the mouth of this bear. And what seems that seems to picture is the probably three kingdoms that Medo-Persia conquered. You had Lydia, which is over in Turkey, 546 B.C. is when they conquered that. Babylon, which will happen in 539. And then Egypt in 525 B.C. Those perhaps could be those three ribs in this hunchback bear's mouth. And then next comes this winged, four-winged creature, leopard, that also has four heads. Oh, man. Now we're really getting monstrosities here, right? Four-headed leopard that has these four wings on it. And this is a picture of Greece, the the kingdom of Greece that would come after Medo-Persia. Leopards, of course, very fast animals. And so this may be a picture of Alexander the Great. Those four wings may also add to the speed or to the strength, perhaps, And what we know historically, Alexander the Great, in a single campaign, conquered the known world and did it very rapidly. But then those four heads, what happens when Alexander the Great dies is four of his generals take over. They actually end up dividing the kingdom in a certain way. And and, well, we'll talk about that more next week because, well, I'll show you why in just a moment. But that's next up is is this four-winged 
uh, leopard, and then finally this monster beast, which is just this zoological monstrosity. It is unclassifiable, and it comes out, and it's just, uh, it's, it's horrific. It's got those sharp teeth and those sharp claws, and then it's got those ten horns, and we find out in verse 24 that the ten horns are ten kings of that one kingdom which this monster beast represents. And that kingdom is Rome, the Roman Empire, which was a very dominant, very powerful kingdom historically. But then there's that also that single horn that displaces three of the horns. What in the world is that all about, right? That's strange. Well, I'll unpack that more in a moment. But I just want you to get this image in your head and, and see the parallel here between these. And then also, just kind of to prime you for next week, in chapter 8, you have some more of this with the goat uh, and the ram. You have this vision of these two, these two animals kind of going heads up with each other. And what that is is Medo-Persia and Greece. And we'll unpack that vision next time. But I do just want to introduce you to that's what's coming. Daniel keeps having these visions of stuff that's going to happen in the future. And here what we have, 600 years, over 600 years of human history that uh, starts with Babylon and goes all the way into the Roman Empire. And, and we'll talk about specifically what is being pictured here with this little horn. He's making war on the saints and what's going on with that and, and all that. Before we get there, what's fascinating is this is how God views human governments. This is the divine perspective on human governments. And it's that these are anxiety-producing creatures. Did you notice Daniel's reaction in verse 15? My spirit within me was anxious. And, and my, the visions of my head, they alarmed me. This is scary stuff. These are, again, these animals that are terrifying, even monsters, that come onto the grand stage of human history and wreak all kinds of havoc on the world. And then this is contrasted. Right when the vision is the darkest, with this monster beast doing all kinds of bad stuff, tearing and stamping underfoot, that's when, verse 9, as I looked, this is still part of the vision, it's the second part of the vision. As I looked, now God shines in the darkness. And, and God shines in the darkness. Thrones, notice plural, thrones. Not just a single throne, but there are thrones that are placed. And that's when the Ancient of Days shows up. And he's got his throne, which seems to be this impressive throne that's greater than all the other thrones. But the Ancient of Days comes and he takes his seat. And while we get a glimpse of the terrifying nature of these animalistic type governments of humans, these worldly powers and worldly kingdoms, now God gives us a glimpse behind the curtain into the spiritual realm. And the continuation of this vision, he sees the Ancient of Days come and he takes his seat. No one else sits down until the Ancient of Days. And the Ancient of Days, of course, would be Yahweh, would be God, the one true and only God. By the way, this is something which other writers in the Old Testament before Daniel picked up on. If you uh, look at Psalm 90, excuse me, yeah, Psalm 90 and verse 2. Psalm 90, verse 2, this is a psalm of Moses. And, and he lives approximately a thousand years before Daniel does. But he, even he understood the eternality and timelessness of God. Psalm 90, verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Everlasting to everlasting. That's an idea, an, an image, poetically, of God's timelessness, his, his eternality. And then Job 36 and verse 26. Elihu, one of Job's friends, comes on the scene, and he's got something he wants to share with Job, and there's a lot to that. But what I want is just one thing that he says about God in Job 36, verse 
26, Behold, God is great, and we know Him not. The number of His years is unsearchable. Now, they may not, Moses and Elihu, they may not use the term, the phrase, ancient of days. But they did understand that God was ancient of days. You can't number His years. He's from everlasting to everlasting. And Daniel here uses that title in order to communicate, again, the eternal nature of God. That even he stands outside of time. And also, since he has this, this throne, which no one else has a throne like this. It issues forth fire, a stream of fire. Uh, and there are thousands of thousands, tens of thousands upon tens of thousands that are standing before him and ministering, serving him. And so he comes. This is God. He sits in his throne, takes his seat. And that's when... The end of verse 10, the court sits. This divine court is now in session. And, and who, who is it that, that is on these other thrones? Well, I believe this, we're supposed to recall Psalm 82 and verse 1, where Asaph, in writing this psalm, talks about the divine court or the divine council of God. Uh, Psalm 82, verse 1. God has taken his place in the divine council. What would that sound like with Daniel? The Ancient of Days has taken his seat. And his throne is issuing forth fire, and there's millions of angelic beings that are worshiping him. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And gods would be other divine beings created. Created beings, created by Yahweh, but they are part and they make up his counsel. You want another image of this? You could read, uh, is it uh, 1 Kings 22? The, the story about Micaiah, the prophet, who, who got a, a, a similar vision that Daniel had of God with all his divine court around him, determining what he was going to do about the king of Judah. But uh, time does not permit us to look at that in detail. As we come back to Daniel 7, I just want to impress upon you, that's the scene that Daniel sees. Yahweh, the Ancient of Days, has his throne. He's the chief justice of this, this divine court where these other thrones are and these other divine beings have taken their seat and it's a judgment scene. And that fire is a picture of the divine presence as well. And these millions of angelic beings worshiping God. And then books were opened. The end of verse 10 tells us books. And these books are the records of the deeds of every human individual, including that little horn. And it is these records that the divine council, the divine court will use in order to make judgment. And so again, you have this divine court with all these other thrones, but then in the midst of them is the chief justice, the supreme ruler of the cosmos, the ancient of days, who takes his seat, and then the court sits. And when the court sits, judgment time. It is fascinating, the contrast between what's happening on earth, where all, there's all kinds of chaos being churned up by these governments, by these kingdoms, and then just a very calm scene that's taking place in the divine court. The Ancient of Days sits down. All the other thrones, they, they, these, these other beings are seated. It's very calm. And that's when I looked, verse 11 and 12, and here's the fate of the beast. I looked because of the sound of great winds. The horn was speaking. Here's that little horn, very boastful, very arrogant, getting ready to say something wacky or crazy or whatever. Very arrogant, very boastful. And as I looked, the beast was killed. I mean, just, just like it's so simple. It was so easy. That's the divine judgment. His body destroyed, given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, though they would continue for a season and a time. They, they continue on. They'll be absorbed into the other subsequent kingdoms that come after this, but that's why they're going to continue. But their authority, their dominion is taken away. They don't have any power. It's simple. It's supernatural. God did this. He issued His judgment from His heavenly supreme court. And things took place just as He willed. 
the fire of, of divine wrath came out and consumed this beast, this monster beast, and specifically that little horn, and he's gone. Silence forever. No more boasts. And then verses 13 and 14. I talked about this uh, last week, early last week, on the, uh, the uh, daily devotional. And, and I unpacked that with some emphasis on the Son of Man title as it's applied to Jesus. And that's right. Who is the Son of Man, this one like a Son of Man, who comes in riding on the clouds, the clouds of heaven? And it's, of course, the pre-incarnate Christ. Jesus will take this title, Son of Man, apply it to himself. And I think that's because we're supposed to look at how it's used in Daniel and understand, ah, oh, well, the, the Ancient of Days, that's Yahweh, and he's taking a seat. And by the way, that imagery of riding on the clouds, that is something which is exclusive to the deity. It's all over your Old Testament, Deuteronomy uh, 33 and verse 26, Psalm 68, uh, verses 32, 33, Psalm 104, verse 3. I just want to draw your attention to one, though. If I had one to pick from, it's this one, Isaiah 19. And verse 1, just to show you, riding on the clouds is a characteristic of God and God alone. Isaiah 19, verse 1, an oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, Yahweh is riding on a swift cloud and comes to Egypt, and the idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence. The heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. Whenever God comes riding in on a cloud, it's always to judge. And so here's this one like a son of man. Who comes riding on the clouds? Wait, I thought God was on the throne. Oh, we're supposed to see here. This is, he's like a son of man, but he's also a divine being, even deity, because only God rides the clouds. And it's all, it's all a judgment scene. And so, who is this? It's the, it must be the pre-incarnate Christ. Yahweh, who takes on flesh to live among us. You may know him as Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, that's, this is Jesus, and he, he shows up in this scene of judgment because he's been out also right in the clouds doing judgment in the world. And so he belongs in this scene as well. And what's given to him? Dominion, verse 14, dominion, glory, a kingdom. Uh, and, and it's a coronation event. The Son of Man is now the sovereign, supreme ruler. Again, the contrast here is stunning. Well, all these monster beasts are down here on earth causing all kinds of chaos. Very calm scene, very calm coronation as the Ancient of Days gives power to the pre-incarnate Christ. That he will receive this kingdom uh, during the time of the monster beast. So, let's actually get a bit of the interpretation here. Uh, and just just briefly make some more connect because that's what the rest of the chapter is about. Is Daniel's like, I don't know what to do with this, right? I mean, we've been going along making connections that that are accurate, I believe, historically. But Daniel, when this happened, he's like, I, I, what do I do with this? And he's all anxious about it. So he asks one of these angelic beings that are there, Hey, what what is this all about? And and that's where he begins to have explanation given to him. Uh, Verse 17, these four great beasts are four kings, verse 17 says. And then in verse 23, we are told that fourth beast is a fourth kingdom. And so king's kingdom, I believe the idea we're supposed to connect with that is this: each of these beasts represents a human government. And that's what's going on here is, yeah, each of Babylon, Medo-Persia, and all that. Uh, so, again, over 600 years of human history, before it happens, Daniel sees it in this vision. By the way, and this should, this should uh, fortify our faith in God's Word. That when God issues prophecy, He is declaring history before it happens. And it happens just as He told it would happen. And so, the beasts are these kingdoms, and, and there you have it on the board. But Daniel wants to know specifically about that fourth monster beast. What's that about? Uh, that beast that will make war on the saints and, and will prevail for a little bit. 
But then the Ancient of Days shows up and ain't nothing but a thing. He takes him out of the way and now the kingdom is given over to the saints. The saints rule. Well, and that's where this gets a bit tricky, right? Because he begins to talk about these ten horns that were on its head. And so this is a artistic... I mean, well, what, what does it look like, right? Nobody really knows. Does it look like a dinosaur? Does it, anyway, you have this weird-looking monster beast that has these ten horns, but then three are removed, and then there's that little one there. And as you go through this, we begin to get the interpretation, and we are told in verse 24, my clicker doesn't want to... There we go. Fourth beast is the fourth kingdom. That's what we're told in verse 23. It's Rome. And then next, we are told... That the ten horns are ten kings. You see that in verse 24. Yes, as for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise. Ah, so we don't have to guess what all the horns, they represent, you know, these uh, ten confederate states or whatever. No, no, no. We're told they're ten kings. And then uh, here are the ten emperors of Rome, starting with Augustus, not Julius Caesar, because he wasn't um, elected by the Senate. There's... And so you start with Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Galba, Oath of Attellus, Vespasian, and Titus. These are the ten kings that are anticipated. And this is what happened historically. But then we are told, after another will arise after them. Right? That's what we're told there in verse uh, 24. He shall be different. He shall put down three kings. That's why the three horns were removed, right? And so, yeah, another will arise after them. And that's supposed to be that little horn there. And he's going to put down three. Uh, There it is. He will uproot three kings. What's that all about? Well, as, again, we look uh, historically, that's why you have the empty spots there. Here's what happens. We have the, here here are the emperors with their reigns. 41 years for Augustus, Tiberius 23, Caligula 4, Claudius 13, Nero 31 years. Galba Oath of Atellus, they reign for a total of a year and a half. And then Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. Ten years, two years, and then 15 years. Domitian is the one that comes after the ten. What's, what's happening with these, uh, with these three that are offset? When Nero dies, Vespasian... Uh, and Titus, they're off actually besieging Jerusalem. And it takes a while for word to get down there from Rome all the way to Jerusalem. And then for Vespasian, he's the one who takes over, to come back and be put in power as the emperor. So what happens? Well, that's when Galba, Otho, and Vitellus, they are generals under Nero, they are made emperor by the Senate. Galba, and then he's killed, and then Otho, and then he's killed, and Vitellus as well. What's interesting about Vitellus is Domitian is in Rome at the time, and he, there's some political intrigue that's happening here. He actually has a hand. He forms an alliance with a guy named Antony, and they actually conspire and kill Vitellus. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that little horn Domitian, he had a hand in the uprooting of at least one, and he may have had a hand in the other two, but you mean he was he was he had a hand in uprooting these little horns? Hmm, interesting. Just as Daniel is saying here, right? And uh yeah, those those three horns that are put down, that seems to be what's going on here with that time of turmoil with Galba, Oath of Atellus. But then that little horn, he finally does come to power. And historically, that's Domitian. He is a blasphemer. He blasphemes God. Uh, We are told um, he's going to wear out the saints. He's going to wage war. And he did that historically. He persecuted the church and shall think to change times and the law. (laughs) What's fascinating is he actually, Suetonius, one of the ancient historians, records Domitian changed the names of some of the months in order to glorify himself. Just like Daniel's talking about here, that's exactly what Domitian does. And it was stunning the lengths to which he would go in order to try and present himself and deify himself. And At any rate, 
uh, time, times, and half a time. Then 26, the court shall sit in judgment. So what we saw in the vision. Uh, dom his dominion taken away, he'll be consumed, destroyed to the end. And uh, Domitian, he's undone. And when that happens, that's when the saints it's, it's, uh, are no longer under the thumb of Domitian. They receive the kingdom, right? That's what it says here. The, the kingdom, dominion, greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. And really, whose kingdom is it? Well, it's Messiah's kingdom. And who, who really handled Domitian? Well, God did it. And all of this is God at work on behalf of his people. Why was this important? Remember, we are 14 years away from the Medo-Persian Empire doing what they're going to do in Daniel's day. Nebuchadnezzar has died. Belshazzar, he's just taken over. And there may be some questions in Daniel and also his fellow kinsmen according to the flesh, his fellow Jewish people that are in Babylonian captivity. Do we even have a future? Is God going to look out for us? And here is God giving this vision to Daniel to say, you know what? I got this for the next over 600 years. And yeah, there's going to be some monster beasts. And we're, we're going to talk about the, the ram and the, the goat and what they're going to do. And they're going to trample all, and cause all kinds of chaos then too, chapter 8. But you don't have to worry about a thing because God and his people, they win. Does this have any application for what we're at doing right now? We have a ram and a goat, a donkey and an elephant, and they're going heads up over stuff. And they're, you know, they're running roughshod all over. and what, It's just all kinds of chaos with the nation. And do God's people have a future? Is God going to look out for us? And it wasn't nothing but a thing for him in Daniel's day. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, look, Messiah, the Son of Man, he ascended to the throne all those years ago. He, we are told, go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12. And this is, this is where we'll, we'll leave off for today. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And verse 12, if we endure, we will also reign with him. You understand that when you became a Christian and, and you were transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Christ, the beloved son, you entered into and now reign with Christ. You are a victor. You are more than overcomer, more than conqueror. Christ, he hasn't given up his throne. He is still on the throne ruling. Your God reigns in Zion, my brothers and sisters. And when all the dust settles with the 2020 election and everything along with that, no matter who's in Washington and no matter what Congress is doing, no matter what the White House is doing, your God reigns and you are with him in that. The saints of the Most High God reign with it. God's kingdom is triumphant. It will endure forever. Do we have a future? You better believe it. Because it's not that God is on our side. We are on, we have aligned ourselves with him and his purposes. I don't know that it got much tougher than living in Babylon in Daniel's day. It was it was rough. You may argue today it's tough to be a Christian. I think that's right. Deck is often stacked against us, but be of good cheer, my brothers and my sisters. Christ is king. We share in his kingdom, monster beast governments notwithstanding. Let's commit this to prayer. God, your wisdom, it really is staggering. Your foresight and foreknowledge is impressive. That you, you know things before they happen. You know even our future and you hold that within your hand. It is comforting to know that no matter what is going on in this world, you are still sovereign over it. And may we see things from your perspective that your dominion and kingdom and greatness really is overall. And while 
There may be things in this world that cause us to be anxious and to be alarmed. We can rest knowing that you are in control. We give you praise, honor, and glory for that in Jesus' name. Amen.